Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. He's worthy of praise. The old deacons would say, I want to thank the Lord for waking me up this morning. I thank God I wasn't found on my, on my cooling board. The Lord is good. But you could be sleeping in your grave, but the Lord is good. And if you're still here, another day. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord. Amen. All standing, all standing for the reading of the word. Today we're coming from Luke chapter 15. And we're going to look at verses 11 through 24. Luke 15, verses 11 through 24. Very, very familiar text. Luke 15, 11 through 24. And it reads as follows. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Yeah. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain had filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's house, my fathers have bread enough to, to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on. Put a ring on his hand and, and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fattest cow and, and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Lord, please decrease all of me, increase all of you. Holy Spirit, have your way. It's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Yes, we are still in our series, The Parables of Jesus. This is part nine of that series. We have been in this series for a while now. This is part nine in the parables of Jesus. The subtopic today is a lost son. A lost son. The story of the prodigal son is one of the most popular parables that there are. As a matter of fact, it is so popular that a lot of people forget that it's a parable and they think it actually took place. It's just that popular. Even non-believers know the story of the prodigal son. The word prodigal, it, it means to spend recklessly. To, to spend recklessly. Or it means to, to wastefully, or to be wastefully extravagant. To spend recklessly, or to be wastefully extravagant. That's what a prodigal means, to spend recklessly or to be 
wastefully extravagant. Here we see in this, this parable, a father had two sons. The younger son, who is the prodigal son in the parable, decided that he wanted his inheritance early. Therefore, he, he asked his father for his share of his inheritance before it was time. Now, there are only two justifiable reasons that someone can receive the inheritance. One of those reasons is if the father did not manage his affairs properly, then the heir could receive the estate and manage the estate. The other reason is if the father died, then of course the heirs would have received their inheritance. But here you have a situation where the father is managing the estate well. There are no issues. Also, the father is, is still living. So there was no need for the inheritance to be distributed early. But although the estate was, was managed well, and although the father is still living, the younger son still wanted his share of the inheritance ahead of time. The younger son wanted his share of the inheritance before the scheduled time. It's interesting, Elder Coleman, that when you read this parable, the father does not question the son when he asks for his share of the inheritance. Uh, the father does not give the son the third degree when the younger son asked him for his share of the inheritance. He doesn't give him the reasons on why he should wait. The father simply gives the younger son his share. Now, I don't want to violate the text. You know how we do this here at the Grace Center. We are a biblically astute congregation. We don't violate scripture. But by looking at this text here, I, I sometimes wonder, Drew, how come the father did not ask the son more questions? He didn't say anything to the son. He just simply gave the son his share. Now, it probably could have been the father knew his son. He knew the ways of his son. And he probably knew that the son was, was stubborn. And he was going to keep asking for his share anyway. But he, he gave his, his son the share of his inheritance early. We, we know certain people as well that sometimes they think they know everything about everything. Hmm. So maybe the father went ahead and gave the son his inheritance early because maybe the son thought he knew everything about everything. In other words, you got certain people who believe that they are always right and you're always wrong. They know everything, Sam, about everything, Ramona. They know everything about everything. And when a person thinks they know everything, you can't tell them anything. <laughs> tweet that, tweet that, tweet that right there. When a person thinks they know everything, you can't tell them anything. So maybe instead of the father asking questions, he simply said, here. Instead of him saying, I don't think this is a good idea, the father just simply said, here. You can tell people not to do a lot of things, but they can be so stubborn in their ways that eventually you just have to say, here. Don't, don't go to this side of town. It's, it's trouble over there. They want to go anyway. Here. Don't hang around this certain person. This person is not good for you. Here. Don't marry this guy over here. I know all about this dude. He, 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 he runs the street. Don't marry this person. But they want to marry the person anyway. Here. When a person thinks they know everything, you can't tell them anything. So the father just simply said, here. The son leaves, and he goes
goes into a, a far country. In other words, he gets as far away from home <laughs> as possible. He, he goes into a, a far country. He doesn't go to the next town over. He goes to a far country. He doesn't go to his friend's house across the street, but he goes to a, a far country. When our daughter graduated from high school, uh, she didn't apply to any local colleges. <laughs> she didn't apply to anything local, uh, PJ. She applied to colleges way out. Uh, <laughs> We like, no, you're staying in state. You're not going out of state. In state tuition, not out of state tuition. Unless you get a scholarship, you in state, in state tuition. She didn't apply to any local colleges. She was accepted in uh, one college with only two hours away. We're like, that's a good college. You know, you can go there. She was like, mm hmm. She decided she wanted to go to Savannah. And Savannah is about four hours away. It is far enough for us to be able to get to her in case something happened, but it's still far enough where she knows we won't just pop up on it. She wanted to go a little far. She must think we're stuck on stupid because we know how young people think. We were young ourselves at one point in our lives, but she wanted to go a little bit further. The son, he, he goes into this, this far country. But something happens, Miss Charlotte, in this far country. The son is in this far country with his know-it-all self. He's in this far country with his share of his inheritance. Uh, he's living it up, Elder Coleman. He's, he's having a ball. Lady Tanya, he, he's having the time of his life. He's all the way turned up. I mean, he's living la vida loca. He is having a ball in this far country. He's living this way until. <laughs> he, he's living this way until. You see, everyone loves you and wants to hang around you until. We've all had an until moment in our life. Yeah, yeah. We may have thought we were smarter. We may have thought we were better. We may have thought we were even richer until. The sun was having a great time in this far country until he ran out of money. He was having a ball, but when he ran out of money, he could not even afford the ball. He was all the way turned up, but when he ran out of money, he had to turn it all the way back down. He was having a great time until. The son had an until moment. Don't, don't worry about your friends and the lost ones and so forth. They just need to have an until moment in their life. They may be on the wrong path now. They just haven't had an until moment just yet. Just wait till they have an until moment. The son had an until moment when he ran out of money and a famine hit the land. The son wasted his inheritance. The son squandered his inheritance. No investments, no stocks, no bonds, no mutual funds, no 401ks, no Roth IRAs, no CDs. He was not prepared when a famine hit the land. He was all out of money, but as hard-headed as he was, instead of him going back to his father's house, he said, I'll just figure it out myself. I figured out all of this on my own. So the son, he decides he would get a job taking care of pigs. He decided, I'm going to take care of pigs. If you know Jewish history, 
Jews considered pigs to be detestable. They considered pigs to be unclean. But here you have a Jew taking care of an animal that he considered detestable. In other words, he's doing something that he said that he would never do. He, he, he's doing something he said that he would never do. Because, you see, when, when you leave the Father's house, sometimes you may do things you said you would never do. You may even go to places you said you would never go. But since you left the Father's house yes. and you are desperate, you're broke, busted, and disgusted. And you say, I'll just have to do what I, what I have to do. The son is taking care of these pigs. And the word says that he even came close to eating the same food that he was feeding the pigs. He didn't eat it, but he thought about it. Out of hunger, he thought about eating this same, the same food that he was feeding the pigs. In other words, when you are outside of the will of God, it's no telling what you may even think about doing. He didn't eat the food. He did not eat the pods and he was feeding the pigs. But he thought about it. He's outside of the will of God. He, he didn't eat it, but he, he, he thought about it. And here you have him feeding pigs food and the pigs has more food in their bellies than he does in his. It, it, the pigs are eating more than he is eating. He was so hungry that he thought about doing something detestable. You see, right now you have a lot of people that have left the father's house and they're not thinking about doing something detestable. They're actually doing it. Killing. Robbing. In other words, they're in a pig pen. They're in a, in a pig pen. Many of you know, I am, I am a country boy. Proud to be a country boy. North Carolina, born and raised country boy. North Carolina, home of the best barbecue ever to call. I know you like barbecue. North Carolina has the best barbecue. Some of you all on barbecue, if you don't mind. Barbecue, you see, you're used to seeing the barbecue on the plate. But a lot of things happen to get it on your plate. See, where we're from, they would take a pig and they did something where they would kill the pig and they would place this pig on a, a grill. You know, it's a big barrel cut in half. And they will place the pig on this on this grill. That they'll cook one side, say, for a few hours, flip it over, cook the other side for a few hours, and you're done. Um, if you had somebody that knew how to do it right, they'll make their own sauce as well. See, uh, Lady Tanya's dad knows how to make some good barbecue. As a matter of fact, he he, he knows how to make the, the burrows that they, you place the pig in. Yeah, yeah. He, he makes the burrows and everything. He makes the sauce and, and all that good stuff. I mean, he, he knows how to make some good barbecue. Yes, sir. And a lot of times in the country, as you cook the pig, when the pig is done, you will flip that lid, sir, and uh, people will go up to the grill, Drew, and they will pick from the pig. They call it a pig picking. Uh, uh, yes, sir. A pig picking. The, the pig is done. You can pick the meat, you can pick the ribs, you can pick all the food you want from that pig. It's a pig picking. But before the pig is ever placed on that grill, some things take place first. Being that I'm from the country, I'm used to seeing pigs roll around in mess. Before it gets on the grill, it gets on your plate, this pig is in a pig pen. Uh, it's in a place where
super, uh, it's stinky. Mm -hmm. It's messy. It's dirty. I know you're used to, 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 your, to your barbecue sandwich with the coleslaw on it, but before it gets you, I'm like, that pig was in a dirty, messy, stinky <laughs> situation. It, it was in a place that you don't want the pig unless you cook it first because it used to be in a stinky, dirty, messy situation. And a lot of people that we know are in the pig pit of life. They're in a stinky, dirty, messy situation. Doing something they never thought they would be doing. Thinking about doing things they never thought about doing. But I'm, I'm so glad, Miss Charlotte, that the story, this, this parable here does not leave the sun in the pig pen. <laughs> I'm glad that the, the, the writer here, Luke, the physician Luke, took up his stethoscope and said, you know, I got some more things I want to write here. I can't leave the sun in the pig pen. I need to take them out. Oh, the pig pen. He, he didn't leave them in the pig pen. See, a lot of people want to leave you <laughs> in the pig pen. And they, they want the story to end right here. They want the, the parable to end with the sun still being in the pig pen. But I'm so glad that God allowed Luke to continue to write, put pen to paper, to finish the script, to finish this scripture, to finish this parable. He didn't leave the sun in a stinky, <laughs> messy, dirty situation. He decided to take them out because a lot of people, if it was their choice, they would leave you in a stinky, <laughs> dirty, and a messy situation. But I thank God that he looked over me. He didn't leave me in my mess. When I was in the pig pen of life. He said, I cannot leave you in a dirty, stinky, messy situation. Luke continues to write. He continued to write. He said, I cannot leave you in the pig pen. Yeah, you may have waddled in some mess. You may have played in some dirt. But I'm not going to let you stay here. You may have said oink, oink a few times in your life, but I can't leave you in the pig pen. I got to take you out. If you look down, if you swipe down, if you scroll down, verse 17 says that he came to himself. Hey, I love verse 17. He, yes. he came to himself. Yes. The Living Bible translation says that he, he came to his senses. Watch this. If, if the Bible say he came to his senses, that tells us that beforehand he was out of his mind. <laughs> he was out of his mind if he came right. to his senses. In other words, he, were, he was doing things he never should have been doing. He was in a place that he never should have been in. Why is he doing something that he never should have been doing? Why was he in a place that he never should have been in? It's because he left his father's house. He, he left his father's house. He, he left the umbrella of his father. He, he left the covering of his father. But watch this. Verse 17 also says, and when he came to himself, he said, watch this, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. He's saying, uh, what in the world am I doing here? At my father's house, the servants have more than they can eat, but why am I here? You see, if you know someone that is lost, if you know someone that is in the world and on the wrong path, uh, you need to write down Luke 15, verse 17. You, you need to write it in your, in your prayer book. You need to write it in your journal. You need to write down the date, their name, and the scripture and pray over that thing. They just need a Luke 15, 17 moment in their lives. 
they, they just need to come to their senses. They need to come to themselves. Verse 18 and 19, watch this. It says, and I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. What's going on here is that the son is rehearsing what he would say to his father when he meets him again. Uh, uh, he's rehearsing what he's going to say to his father when he goes back home. He had his title. He had the introduction. He had the body. He also had the conclusion to his speech. He, he had his entire speech ready for his father when he went back home. But let's look at what happens in the next verse. Verse 20. It says, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. In other words, the father ran and embraced his son who was returning home. But it's something I want to focus on in verse 20. And that's the fact that it says that the father saw the son a great way off. <laughs> the, the, the father saw the, the son a, a great way off. Some of your Bibles can say he saw the son from a distance. He, he, he saw the son from a, a distance. In other words, this should tell you that the father never gave up on the son returning home. The, the father never gave up on the son returning home. Days went by and the father was still looking for his son. He, he was still looking now for his son. Weeks could have went by but the father was still looking for his son. Months could have went by, Muna, but he was still looking for his son. It could have been years, but the father was still looking yeah, yeah. for his son. He, he let time go by, but each and every day the father went out and he was looking for his son. Great sinner, I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that the father did not give up on me and he kept on looking for me to return back home. Even when I was in, a, in my mess, he was still looking out the windows of heaven and he was waiting for me to return home. He was looking out the windows of heaven waiting for you to return. He was looking out for you to return home. He's also looking out the windows of heaven waiting for your, your family, yeah. your friends, yeah. and your loved ones to return home as well. Verse 21, it says, And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. You see, the son was ready to give his entire speech. <laughs> the, the, the son was ready to give his entire speech. Uh, he probably memorized his speech because he rehearsed his speech. He prepared his speech. He probably spell checked his speech. He probably rehearsed his speech in, in front of the pigs and he was feeding. But the father didn't even give the son time to complete the full speech that he was rehearsing. The father, the son was probably getting ready to say his speech and he, he was prepared to say it and so forth. And he was rehearsing it over and over. He was coming on that long road rehearsing what he was going to say to his father. But when he got to his father, his father just threw away the shit. I, I don't want any of the sheets right now. I don't, I don't need the speech right now. I'm, I'm glad that you hope. Give me a hug. Forget the speech. I'm embracing you now. The son never gave a, never had a chance. The, the father didn't give the son a chance to complete his entire speech. <laughs> he never talked about the hired servants. He, he never talked about because the father did not give him time to complete the entire speech. But 
the father did this. He, he interrupted the son. Then he called his servants and he asked for four things. We'll talk about it. We'll be out here to get some branch. He, he, he said, four things I need for you to do. When he called his servants. He said, hey, sir, bring me the best robe. Not just any old kind of robe. Bring me the best robe that's in the back. The robe, watch this now. The robe is a sign of restoration. The son came home. He was in a stinky, dirty, messy situation. He was in a pig pen. He probably smelled. In other words, he had the old man when he came home. But the father said, bring me out the best robe. I'm going to put on the best robe on top of your stinky, <laughs> messy, yeah, yeah. dirty situation. I don't care how you smell. I don't care how you look. I'm putting on a new, a new, a new. That's the old man that was in the world. I'm putting on a new robe. I'm restoring you. You're back home now. I'm putting on the best robe. It's a sign of restoration. But then he also says, servant number two, bring me out the ring. Mm. They brought the ring out. The ring is a sign of authority or approval. Mm. There's many examples in the Bible that talks about rings and so forth. One example you may be familiar with is the story of Esther and Mordecai and the Jews. When Haman wanted to kill all the Jews and so forth, he wrote a decree that went out telling everyone that all the Jews would be killed. Word got back to the king. Uh, the king found out what Haman was up to. Of course, Haman was hung by his own gallows. And uh, Mordecai got promoted. So the king gave Mordecai the ring and said, those old decrees that Haman wrote, take my ring, write a new decree, and Stamp it and seal it with the ring, showing that I approve this message. <laughs> uh, I'll write another decree letting all the Jews know that they're not going to be exterminated. Uh, they're not going to be taken out. Take my ring and stamp the new decree. It, it was a sign of approval. So then, here in the parable, when the father gave the son the ring, it says, son, I approve you. Yeah. I know you was in the world. I know you was in a mess. I know you was in a pig pen, but you know what? Take the ring anyway. I'll put the ring on it. Take the ring, put it on because I approve you, son. Yeah, yeah. I don't care what happened in the past. Third thing he gave to him, he said, servant number three, mm. bring me out the sandals. Back in those days, servants or slaves walked around barefoot. Servants or slaves walked around barefoot. So when the, the father here told the servant to bring his son some sandals, it was another sign to show that it was a sign of restoration, but also to let the son know he is free. <laughs> it is another sign to let the son know you are now you are not a slave. You're not going to walk around here barefoot. You are going to some sandals on your feet. I know what you did, but here are some sandals to place on your feet. Last thing he said, servant number four, bring me out the fetid calf. The fetid calf. Let's, let's have Bible study on Sunday morning. The, the, the fetid calf. What does that represent? Back in those days, a family sometimes had one fatted cow. They used to feed this fatted cow a uh, special kind of foods and so forth. Uh, it, was on, it was on a special kind of diet. So that when you, when you uh, ate the cow, you could, it was so flavorful. It, was, it, it tasted so good because it was on this, this special kind of diet. So that they fed uh, this fatted cow special kinds of food. So when they ate this fatted calf, uh, it would be flavorful. It would be good. 
excuse me, was the best one to eat. But they only ate it on special occasions. They, they only ate it when it was time to celebrate. So in other words, when the father said, bring me out the fatted calf, what he was saying was, it is time to celebrate. Bring me out the fatted calf. Don't bring me the other one. Y'all don't care nothing about. Bring me out the one you've been feeding all this time. Bring them out. It is time to throw a party. It's time to celebrate. Why is it time to celebrate? Because my son is now home. You see, when you return home, all of heaven rejoice because God brought up the fattest calf. He says, time to throw a party. Now, they was having a party. As they're celebrating, the older son, who was at home the whole time, gets upset <laughs> with the younger brother. Why? Because the younger brother received the robe. The younger brother received the ring. The younger brother received the sandals. The younger brother received the, the fatted calf. And he said, I've been here this whole time. I, I've been right here in the house the whole time. Let's do some teaching. Once again, let's have Bible study yes, on a Sunday morning. All right. Now, how we do it here, Grace Simple? I'm giving 
giving you all of me now, heart, mind, and soul. I'm, I'm giving you everything I've got. So when I give myself to you, I'm saying, here. Yeah, yeah. The younger son was wise. He, he used wisdom in the end. When the younger son came home, he wasn't just hungry for food. but He was hungry for his father. He was hungry for his father. Here in, in, in Luke 15, we have three parables in Luke 15. We, we talked about these past three weeks. The first one in Luke 15 talks about the shepherd going after the sheep. The second parable talks about the woman searching for the lost coin. Then this third parable here in Luke 15 talks about the, uh, the son returning home. Three different stories, three different parables, but something very interesting in those three. In the first two, the shepherd goes looking for the sheep. The one that goes looking for the corn. But in this third parable, the father stays home. Father don't go anywhere. This tells us that a lot of times God allows you time. Real life, yeah. you need yeah. to come home. Yeah. I'm looking out for you, but I'm not going to go and force you to come home. I'm not going to go in the nightclub and drag you out. I may, I may woo you to come back. I may be looking for you. I'm not going to make you do anything. You have to come back to your own sex. You have to come to your own self. And you have to realize that the world don't care nothing about you. But if you want to come home, the light is still on. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the door is still ready for you. We have open door policy here. Whenever you want to come home, you can come home. But I'm not going to force you to come home. The father was looking out. But he didn't go searching for the son. Like the shepherd went searching for the sheep. And the one who looked for the lost coin, the father stayed home and said, he'll, he'll get it together. He'll figure it out when he needs to figure out his know-it-all self. <laughs> when the world beat you up, you will come back and <laughs> let me back in because the world is a bit bully. It will take your lunch money. The son, he, he was lost. But when he came home, the father received the son back home again. If you got lost ones and so forth, continue to pray on them. Continue to seek the will of God for their lives. And hope and pray that they have a Luke 15 verse 17 moment in their lives where they will realize they need to come to their senses. Don't give up on them. The Father never gave up on the Son. He was just looking out for the Son. That Son, that daughter, the, the parable says son, but it's not really gender specific. It means son and daughter. So that, that person that's lost, keep praying for them. And pray that they come to their senses and return back to the Father's house. Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand of praise in this place. The doors of the church are open.